through some of the slides more quickly um, on um, a few of these areas, and I'll probably tell you rather than ask you for some of the information. And I think uh, some of these you're probably more familiar with uh, than others if you've been teaching the course for a while. And one of those is probably, if you have taught this course in the past, you probably know our next object. So we're going now to something very different. We're going to India before the coming of Islam, uh, which actually never reached the southern heartland of Tamil Nadu. It never controlled this very uh, southern uh, part of India, which has its own regional traditions and had its own great empires. And the greatest of these um, was the Chola dynasty, uh, which really comes into its own in the 10th and 11th and 12th century. A lot of that under the king Raja Raja Chola I, who expands the empire. Here was their capital at Tanjore or Tanjavore. And he expands their influence not only within India, all this gray is direct control under the Cholas from the central capital, but also to Sri Lanka. And that civil war in Sri Lanka that just ended less than, what, 10 years ago was a result of the Chola conquest from over a thousand years ago, which made the top half Tamil Hindu and the bottom of Sri Lanka Buddhist in a different kingdom. And so, um, but they were um, a, a maritime dynasty, um, which then extended influence far into Southeast Asia. So you see in the purple, uh, on these maps, um, receiving tribute and, in kind of a feudal-like state uh, from Indonesia, Malaysia, um, coastal, peninsular, um, Southeast Asia. So it was a huge, very powerful dynasty. And so they had access to a lot of resources. And i just show you a little bit about the arts that were developing here. This is early, so it's 10th century Chola Temple just plant this in your mind, some of the basic Hindu temple components. These were small. The dynasty is, no long, is not yet a world power. And this, I believe this temple is actually built by one of the queens. Or is, and I'll show you how it's associated with the queen. But notice, Hindu temple, this is simple, small. A cella called the Garbhagriha, and a pillared porch called a mandapa two basic components of any Hindu temple. So we see it in this early Chola temple. These were carved granite, um, so not an easy stone to work with. And the imagery, uh, you see these stone niche figures. This is cut, again, in granite or green stone, a very hard stone. And look what they do with the figures in the 10th century. Oh, like life size, like a person, fleshy, very naturalistic, but also idealized. That's when they begin to develop the bronze sculptures in the Chola dynasty. So this 10th century period, and some of these we know because they're portraits. So this is a queen who's recognizable by her features. She's so human, yet she's perfect, sensuous, engaging. And here she is being depicted here and here as the goddess Parvati, the wife of Shiva, the great god. So we have this beautiful sculptural style developing in bronze in concert with their stone sculptures that ornament their temples. Now, Raja Raja, when he takes over Sri Lanka, and goes international. He brings back a lot of wealth. He has now established himself as an empire, and they build an imperial temple in their capital city, the great temple of Tanjore, 200 feet high in granite. Give you a sense of scale. And they began to commission many, many, many of this sculpture. This is Shiva Nataraja. 
probably a very familiar form to you. Uh, there's one from the Met in your image set. Um, this is the one from Cleveland, a clearly imperial sculpture from uh, Tanjore from the capital, um, and one of the greatest outside of India. And the subject matter is interesting because although you have dancing Shiva called Natesha in earlier medieval depictions of Shiva, you don't have Nataraja with the same gestures. So where does this come from? Here's the capital. Here's the city on the coast at the river delta of Chidambaram. This Calvary River here uh, that Tanjore is just to the south of. This is an incredible important area for transit, for control. And as they grow in importance in the 10th century and then the 11th, the Cholas began to invest a lot of money and interest in Chidambaram because this is a great sacred center in South India. It is the home of a local cult of Shiva. Um, it's often called the Tilai cult or Tilai temple. Tilai is the region around the city of these beautiful trees, forest, called Tilai, and they associate him as the Lord of Tilai. And Shiva, apparently, in the local lore, came there and would wander the groves of the city, and he would perform dances. And so this is his place, this special form of Shiva. And the Cholas extend their influence here. They began patronizing the temple. It was a Chola king who first put gold on this wooden hall where Shiva Nataraja is enshrined. And they also began commissioning many images of Nataraja. So this is the Nataraja, uh, Nataraja Gallery uh, at the Tanjore Museum. And a friend of mine who, who's been always compares this to like going to see the Rockettes. Because <laughs> it's a stunning display. I mean, it's such an iconic, powerful image. And it's one thing when you encounter one, but it really is something when you see them in multiple. Um, and you can see, actually, even in this photo, there's slightly different style. These are different workshops. There are imperial workshops in the capital of Tanjore making these bronzes but also at local temples and other towns around Tamil Nadu. And you can see over time, but also by region, the style of the sculpture changes a little bit. Um, these are amazing. Cast bronze or copper alloy, lost wax method. Sure, that's how they get the wonderful flashy details. They're solid. Solid unusual and it's damn near impossible to make. This is the medieval world. Greek bronzes, the greatest early bronzes in the history of art, hollow. So we're talking about ancient recipes being applied with such care and precision that they were able to cast them solid and they wouldn't bubble, they wouldn't crack, they wouldn't break. Nobody else in the history of art until the modern period tried to do this. So um, when you talk about bronze sculpture, great bronze art in the world, everybody looks at the cholas as this high point. And they're right, because they couldn't replicate it until the modern period with modern science. Um, so they're um, amazing. Um, just amazing works technically um, and beautifully. And um, Shiva is so associated with dance, said that he developed, it's believed that Nataraja developed the 108 great dance forms, which form the basis of Indian, at least South Indian classical dance. So you see some dancers here um, uh, in a gallery, my gallery actually, um, making the pose of Nataraja and some of the asanas, uh, which are associated with him. And so he is the patron uh, deity of dance, both in the past and today. So here he is, and this is a different version. Um, it's ours, but I wanted to show it to you because 
it doesn't have the mandorla of flame, which is unfortunate, but because it doesn't, you can really get around it. Um, and so what I want you to look at, and we'll just do more looking, you know what the symbolism is, I'm sure you've, it's in the textbooks. Um, but what I want you to get is the aesthetics of this piece. The way that the limbs move and bend almost the way that a tensed muscle would, but it's still soft. There's an ease about it. Um, it suggests motion, but it's frozen. There's something, and it's engaging you. When you see these chola icons and, and sculptures, they look right at you, almost like a person greeting you. There's something so human about them, but they're perfect. They're not real. Um, they can make bronze look like flesh. Not every culture could do that. So you can look at it, uh, them in detail. Amazing uh, proportions with these broad, round shoulders, little waists, and little bits of flesh. Like, oh, there's always a pool of flesh. I love Indian art. You're allowed to be fleshy. It's like the only place in the history of art where the body and all of its fleshiness is celebrated. It's part of what makes you human. It's what makes an image of the divine human on your level. So, you know, the drum, the rhythm of existence, the rhythm of its dance, you know, the fear not gesture. And then he points to the foot, was about to move in this great dance. The fire that will purge and cleanse the earth, purify the earth. Um, the dance that he performs. Uh, and in mythology, at the end of the Kali Yuga, the great dark era, you know, the era at the end of the cycle of time when we have to start over again, you know, when times of war and distress and times of Congress not being able to pass a bill and, you know, no health care and all these bad things coming together, this is the time Shiva will come. And you'll hear him with the drum. You'll hear the thunk, thunk, thunk. And he will come, and he will have the cleansing fire. And he will begin his dance. And as he begins it in this whirl of fire, he will bring an end to the era of darkness and a rebirth of a new golden age. And in his dance, through this purification, through this act, he will crush ignorance, what is blackening our time. And that's not a baby. It's a dwarf, a nature imp, uh, that's meant here to symbolize ignorance, which is a negative quality. And just look at the rendering of the body the weight of the limbs, the roundness, the flesh, the bends. Um, these chola sculptures are unbelievable. And then how were they used? These, uh, what became a political icon for the Chola dynasty? Um, because Nataraja then began being dispersed in every temple. These grand, grand images it almost became a uh, some scholars argue it is a state symbol for the Cholas. Um, they are used two ways. On most of the time, they live in a temple subshrine. So I'll walk you through one. This is a great South Indian temple complex in the city of Kanchipuram. Um, you enter through great gateways into the temple and later in later dynasties often build new walls and new gateways further out. So it's often like going through an onion as you walk through these spaces, starting from the tallest structures to smaller and smaller spaces across courtyards, through pillared halls, and now you begin to enter into interior spaces. And you will find sub-shrines, not the main shrine, of one of these South Indian temples, but particularly 
talking about Shiva. So Shiva, the bronze, lives in a sub-shrine where it is enshrined and worshipped in a form of worship we call puja. And in puja, um, it's a ritual offering where you make offerings to the god, usually through a priest as a mediator. And through Sanskrit prayers, the priest shares the offering to the god. And then some of those offerings are blessed and given back, and you take those. So if it's a flower, you can take the flower with you. If it's food, you can taste the food because it's been blessed by god. It's called prasad. And um, the other important aspect of this puja is when you're there in front of the enshrined live icon, you are looking at it and it, like that Nataraja with its carved, you know, incised eyes, is looking at you. And because God, the deity, has been invoked into the image, that means you are looking at God and God is looking at you and there is an exchange of divine blessing. And that is called darshan, divine seeing. And it's fundamental to the practice of Hinduism. And you can experience that through seeing these images. And when they're under worship, they're treated like human beings. They're washed in the morning. They're put to sleep at night. They're dressed. They're given garlands and flowers, perfumes, and the food that you bring in, and offered flames. And these are presented before the deity during puja. And then, on special days of the year, special religious festivals, those images, which are considered to be portable images in the subshrines, these bronzes, are taken out on temple carts from their shrine by the priests. And this is a, the great temple cart at Chidumbaram, filled, uh, usually wooden, filled with carvings. And then they will be processed through the city. So here you can see the same cart, and it's been wonderfully draped and decorated, and it becomes a replica of a temple. And this is the tower on top and the flag, and so you know the god is in there. It's live. And the priest sits with the bronzes, and others help pull it manually. They still do this. The term juggernaut, you know, the, you always hear it in football. He's a juggernaut can't stop him. Well, that term comes from India. It comes from the great cart festival, temple cart festival in Puri in Orissa, where the local deity is called Juggernaut. And the British came up with that term to apply to things that get out of control and unstoppable, because there's a point in the city that those carts would, if they're bigger than this, they process, and they would often get out of control. They'd be on a uh, incline and just <laughs> and people could die because thousands of people are there to receive darshan so that big unstoppable force <coughs> juggernaut in the English language comes from the unstoppable divine temple cart in Puri and I think I have one more I tried to blow this up and you can even see the priest sitting here and the images ready so you can receive darshan too as it passes through the street. <laughs> 